it's hard to kind of get away from alcohol in our current culture. When I was giving a talk on sort of lifestyle modification and fertility to a bunch of fertility doctors, I asked, you know, hey, audience, what do you tell your patients? And some people said, I tell them absolutely stop because nobody knows how much is too much. And on the other end, people say, man, that is sometimes the only way that my patients can relax and I'm not going to take that away from them. They can continue drinking. Welcome to Baby or Bust. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and I am tired of infertility and miscarriage being misunderstood, hidden, and full of stigma. Welcome to the podcast with interviews and in-depth discussions and topics, all things reproductive health. Thank you to our friends at Seattle Sperm Bank and Braze Run Productions for sponsoring the show. Please take a moment to give us a five-star review anywhere you listen to your podcast. It really helps people find the show. Happy New Year! This episode airs Monday, January 1st, 2024. If you were out celebrating last night, you might be rethinking the bottomless champagne that you ordered and the drinks that seem to be synonymous with New Year's celebrations and all types of social situations. You may be thinking through your New Year's resolutions and deciding whether to commit to a dry January pledge. If conceiving is on your wish list for 2024, you may be asking yourself how much alcohol is okay and not okay while trying to conceive. And we will be doing a deep dive into this topic in this week's episode of Baby or Bust Fertility Podcast. Alcohol and fertility, how much is too much? If you are trying to conceive and you are trying to figure out how much alcohol is too much or when to stop and you're confused, you are not alone. We're going to go through the evidence and I want you to understand how it impacts your reproductive health. It's confusing because different studies so different things and people have very strong opinions about alcohol and fertility, but we're going to go through the evidence. I'm going to answer your questions. And at the end, I'm going to tell you what I tell my own patients. The message is out there that once you know that you're pregnant to stop drinking alcohol, and this is what I tell my patients too, because there's an association with alcohol intake and birth defects, specifically fetal alcohol syndrome, and nobody really knows how much alcohol is okay, like what that threshold is. And so the safest thing is to just, once you're pregnant, stop drinking. But when you're trying to get pregnant before you're actually pregnant, There's a lot of mixed information about whether and when you should stop drinking alcohol. And my patients do all sorts of different types of things. And they come from different providers and different clinics that say different things. Some people will drink as much as they want, pretty heavy, until after ovulation. So they sort of think to themselves, okay, if there's any chance I'm in the second half of my cycle and I could possibly be pregnant, that's when I'm going to stop. But before that, I'm going to do whatever I want. Other people just kind of continue drinking, you know, no changes whatsoever while they're trying to conceive. And then once they're pregnant, that's when they say they're going to stop drinking. And then there is everything in between. Now, too much alcohol is not good for anyone's health, whether it's reproductive health you're focused on or other types of health. Too much alcohol, it disrupts your sleep. It's associated with weight gain. It throws off metabolism. It can throw off blood sugars. Too much alcohol really can affect your overall health. And so it makes a lot of sense that too much alcohol could impact your reproductive health. But how much is too much? We're going to go through some evidence focused on women. And when I say women, I mean people with uterus and ovaries. And then we're going to go through evidence for men. And by men, I mean people with testicles and sperm. And we're going to talk about what the American Society of Reproductive Medicine recommends. And then I'll finish it off with my personal recommendation. So what does the evidence show for women and alcohol and fertility? Well, There's a lot of different studies, and they all say a little bit something different. One study published in Fertility and Sterility, which is the journal of ASRM, our American Society of Reproductive Medicine, looked at over 7,000 women in Stockholm, Sweden, and it was self-reported alcohol intake and an observation of fertility or how long it took to get pregnant. And they found that high levels of alcohol consumption, which they defined as more than two drinks a day, was associated with a significantly longer time to pregnancy. So more alcohol intake was associated with infertility or taking longer to conceive. 
So another study came out in 2021, Journal of Human Reproduction, looked at alcohol intake and trying to conceive. This time an American woman studied about 400 women who were trying to conceive over a 19-month period, and they saw a dose-dependent response. The more the women were drinking, the lower chances they had of getting pregnant. What's different about this study is they actually isolated it to different parts of the menstrual cycle, and they saw the biggest effect in people who were drinking in the post-ovulatory phase or the luteal phase of the cycle, after ovulation, before you know you're pregnant. Non-drinkers had about a 41% chance of getting pregnant in that 19-month period. Moderate drinkers, that's three to six drinks per week in that luteal phase, had about a 32% chance of getting pregnant. And heavy drinkers, which they defined as six or more drinks per week during that time, had about a 27% chance of getting pregnant. So it's a little bit different, but it is showing that the more that you drink, and especially during that luteal phase, had a lower chance of getting pregnant. Overall, if you compare non drinkers to moderate plus heavy drinkers, the moderate and heavy drinkers had about half the chance of getting pregnant in that 19 month period. As compared to the non-drinkers. Another interesting thing about this study is that they look at binge drinking and the impact on fertility. And this is the only study that I could find that looked at that. They defined binge drinking as drinking enough alcohol to get your blood levels above the legal limit for driving. And for women, most of the time that works out to four or more drinks in two hours. What's interesting is they found that any binge drinking was associated with at least a 19 to 20% decreased chance of getting pregnant in that particular cycle. Now, if that depresses you or makes you worried, it's okay. There's other studies that show that moderate drinking is okay. Specifically, there's a Danish study published in 2016 that looked at moderate drinking, which they defined as less than 14 drinks per week for women, and showed that in over 6,000 women that were observed and self-reported their drinking, that if they drank less than 14 drinks per week, there was no difference in fertility or time to conception. And if you aren't confused yet, here's another study that actually supports drinking. There was a 2006 study published in a large cohort uh, studying Danish people, and it actually showed that the women who occasionally drank wine had a higher chance of conceiving over a five-year study period compared to women who didn't drink at all. So are you confused? Yeah, it's okay to be confused. Some studies say drinking affects fertility in women, others don't. And there's even some studies that say that wine is beneficial. So what does the American Society of Reproductive Medicine say? In their practice committee guideline on optimizing natural fertility, they say that higher levels of alcohol consumption by women, which they define as more than two drinks per day, with one drink containing 10 grams of ethanol or more, is probably best avoided when attempting pregnancy. But there is limited evidence to indicate the more moderate alcohol consumption adversely affects fertility. That is what our guidelines say. So, you know, moderation may not be great if you're drinking a lot or moderately or heavily, but they can't say that you should absolutely stop drinking completely when you're trying to conceive. What about men? What about alcohol and sperm? So there is strong evidence that chronic alcohol use can adversely impact sperm production count, motility, morphology, and function. But again, for men, how much is too much? What does the evidence say? There is an excellent review and very detailed analysis about what we know about how alcohol impacts us on a cellular level. It includes how it impacts sperm because sperm is a cell that they, you can study pretty easily. It's really dry. It's really hard to get through it. It put me asleep a couple of times, but you can't say that information isn't out there. This is a very detailed and wonderful resource if you truly want to understand what alcohol does on a cellular level and what the evidence is behind sperm. Um, but when you're studying people and fertility, we kind of look at it in a different way. And we know that chronic alcohol dependence for men is associated with lower testosterone levels, erectile dysfunction, loss of libido. So we know that that impacts. But what about moderate consumption? What about every once in a while alcohol and male fertility? 
There are studies out there similar to the ones that we went over with women looking at, you know, self-reported alcohol intake and time to pregnancy, but in men, and they do show that moderate to heavy alcohol use in the male partner can be associated with a longer time to conceive for the couple. But again, the evidence is varied. Um, It's kind of all over the map. So what does the American Society of Reproductive Medicine say? So in that same practice guideline, this is what they say. Although significant alcohol consumption has been associated with detrimental hormonal and semen markers in males, a dose response pattern has not been established. And there is lack of evidence for any effect of moderate alcohol consumption on male fertility. So they're basically saying that there absolutely is impact on health and even reproductive health, but moderate alcohol, you can't prove that it dramatically impacts fertility. So let's recap because alcohol and fertility, it's been studied a lot and the results are a little bit all over the map. We can all agree that once you're pregnant, no alcohol intake because we are just not sure how much is too much and alcohol intake is associated with birth defects. While you're trying to conceive, the evidence in general recommends not chronic heavy alcohol use that can absolutely impact your fertility and where we're kind of a little bit all over the place is moderate alcohol use is probably okay. And how much is too much? Everybody says something a little bit different. Now I can tell you what I tell my patients. I talk to my patients about, hey, alcohol is a part of our social fabric. It is a part of celebrating. It is a part of relaxing at the end of the day. It is, you know, rosé all day. It is five o'clock somewhere. It's a part of vacation. It's a part of going out to dinner. It's hard to kind of get away from alcohol in our current culture. Also, when you're trying to conceive and you usually go out with friends and have a glass of wine or two, if all of a sudden you're not having a glass of wine, cue the questions. Are you pregnant? Oh my gosh, I know you guys have been trying. And oh, it's just like, maybe you don't want to really talk about that right then. So it's just like, you know, there's a lot that kind of folds into this. When I was giving a talk on sort of lifestyle modification and fertility to a bunch of fertility doctors, I asked, you know, hey, audience, what do you tell your patients? And some people said, I tell them absolutely stop because nobody knows how much is too much. And on the other end, people say, man, that is sometimes the only way that my patients can relax and I'm not going to take that away from them. They can continue drinking. And most people were somewhere in the middle. And I talked to my patients about You know, one thing to really know about alcohol is there's a lot of stuff in alcohol. It's not really that well regulated, if at all. Think about the pesticides that kind of go into making grapes. Think about the color additives and a lot of the sulfites that are in wine, especially. And, you know, we just don't always know exactly what's in alcohol. So when you are choosing to drink, maybe try to choose wisely. Um, There are some great organic options and some labels that are really focused on trying to be transparent about what they're putting into their wine, grain, alcohol, beer, et cetera. So I kind of talk about that because it's a great reminder of just like not all products are necessarily the same. And I talk about how it shouldn't be a part of my patient's everyday life. Like if I really ask, there's quite a few people that honestly have a bottle of wine every single night. You know, they get home, pour a glass to kind of relax. They pour another glass while they're cooking dinner and they sit down to a show, another glass or two as they're watching the show. And all of a sudden, whether it's between one or two people, the bottle of wine is gone and it really can disrupt sleep. It can disrupt metabolism. Um, It's associated with increased anxiety and depression. And so daily or heavy alcohol use, I do think that can impact our overall health. But I don't think we have to take something away that we truly enjoy. So just in moderation, you know, out to dinner, celebrating with friends every once in a while. And that when we drink, it's not to a point of excess. It's truly enjoying um, and keeping it to a minimum and everything in moderation. This week's fertility story, I'm going to share a story about a couple that I met early in my practice. I still think about them when I'm talking about alcohol with my patients today, and I want to share their story. Early in my practice, I didn't ask 
enough detailed questions about alcohol. I would ask about smoking and kind of in general caffeine intake and alcohol intake. But most people kind of graze over the answers and it's just sort of a quick part of the intake. And this is how my interactions are with my doctors. My doctors ask me about alcohol. You know, it's just a really quick part of the discussion and you kind of like don't really go into deep depth. But I will never forget a couple that came to see me about 10 years ago. They're in their mid thirties. They've been trying to conceive for over a year. Their testing was pretty unremarkable. Her cycles were very regular. It was obvious that she was ovulating. The anatomy checkup was okay. She had a good egg supply. His sperm was adequate. It was just okay, but nothing alarming. And uh, when we did our intake, we kind of talked a little bit about like, oh yeah, we have a couple glasses of wine each week and just didn't really think about it very much in their care. We did IUIs and at appointments, either for ultrasounds for her or follow-up visits or actually at the IUI appointment, they always came together and she would always ask me about lifestyle things they could change. And I was always talking about nutrition and sleep and stress management and answered questions about supplements. and. She'd always really ask, hey, is there anything else that we could do to improve sperm? And I just always answered her questions. He was always there. I asked if he had any questions and it's not until later until I really kind of knew what was going on. At one follow-up visit, she came alone. It's the first time I ever actually talked to her just by herself. We went through typical questions and options and she paused for a second and she asked very directed questions about alcohol and specifically how alcohol could affect male factor fertility. This is the first time she really brought that up and I could tell she was very concerned. She's worried sick about how much alcohol her husband was drinking and he would get really angry if she brought it up and that is why they never talked about it at the fertility visits or at appointments when he was present. I talked to her about, hey, too much alcohol really might impact function of sperm. I went over some of the studies that I shared with you guys today. And we finished the visit with planning on IVF being the next step for the couple. I really wish I could share with you a happy ending for this couple, but she canceled her plans for the stimulation of her ovaries for IVF about a week before she was supposed to start the cycle. And when I called to check in, she said, you know, things just aren't going really well. Her husband's drinking had gotten significantly worse. They were fighting and they were honestly planning on separating. I'd rather share hopeful stories with you and happy endings. I don't know what happened to the couple later in life. I really hope they're doing well, but it's just such an important learning for me and lesson to not just graze over these topics really quickly. And I talk to patients differently about it. Like when I say, hey, tell me about exposures. Let's talk about tobacco, alcohol, marijuana. And if they say, yeah, I have alcohol every once in a while, I'm like, okay, what's every once in a while to you? And I really ask detailed questions because some people every once in a while is a glass of wine once a month out to dinner. And for other people, it's a glass of wine every single evening when they come home or multiple. And alcohol is such an integral part of society and social interactions. So I really appreciate my interaction I had with that couple. Again, I'm sorry it's not a happy ending, but it really helped me have more thorough discussions with patients and I can do a lot more education. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Alcohol and fertility is such a common, confusing interaction and my patients ask me about it all the time because different people give different recommendations. So talk to your doctor about what is best for you and your personal situation. Find this episode and all others at my website, drlaurashaheen.com. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. I love educating. Make sure and share your own fertility story or topics you'd like us to cover, people you'd like us to interview. You can send us an email to hello at drlaurashaheen.com. 
Thank you to my producer, Shannon Perry, and her team at Audiotocracy. This is your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and I'll see you next week where we will be talking all about exercise while you're trying to conceive. Until then, wishing you love, luck, and pineapples.